How are you guys doing? Good, I hope. We got some timeless music today by the doors. We got some timeless drinks. Oh, yes, baby. This is home. All right. So uh, we continue. Uh, today's kind of a special day. Uh, we're wrapping up a chapter, the chapter on tangent slopes. Remember when we first started, I said uh, a calculus has two main questions that it addresses. One of them was with tangent slope. And, uh, we're almost close to the end of this chapter. This is really nice. Uh, every time we take a slope, we're finding the quotient of two infinitely small quantities. Every time we do that, we're dividing zero by zero, so to speak. And we're doing it with great elegance and grace. Real quickly, for last time we continued building on our list of known and famous derivatives. Uh, you know, you bring this down, you subtract one from the exponent. You just call the power rule. Whenever uh, the x is a variable and the derivatives with respect to that x and you have a constant on the exponent, you can use the power rule. We built on that some more famous derivatives, constants, ln's, trig functions. We built on that on the famous uh, derivative properties, the quotient, the derivative of the top times the bottom, minus the top, derivative of the bottom, or the bottom square, or the derivative of f of stuff, f prime of stuff. Never forget this stuff prime at the end. We are we got our famous sheet here uh, outlining all the super famous things. You should go through this. Make sure you own everything. Prove it. Last time we did implicit derivatives, slap that D on both sides. We used to do D DX on both sides or D D T. Last time we learned you can just do a plain old D. And uh, don't make it with respect to anything. And then and then we learned that you should, when you do that, you must, absolutely must do chain rule on everything. Um, the only exception is constants, maybe the derivative of constant is zero. And we also learned about this Uber algebra, the fact that you can treat these differentials, dx and dy, as algebraic quantities, uh, ignoring the fact, or uh, despite the fact that they're infinitely small quantities, close to zero. You can still divide by them and do all kinds of uh, algebraic things with them. Call that Uber. That's Uber Algebra. Uh, that was very nice, uh, and uh, that had deep implications. Uh, we did stuff like that. Uh, that's where we're at uh, today, uh, and today we do more of the same, more derivatives. The only thing that's different today is the music. Oh yeah, baby. Let's set this thing on fire. Uh, really, it's more of the same, but uh, it has a slightly different flavor. Let me explain what that mean by that. Today we're doing high derivatives. So before we take in the derivative of y, so we call that y prime. Now imagine that you take that derivative and then you take the prime of the prime. Well, that would be, that's what we call y double prime. And even then, suppose you took yeah, we got y double prime. Uh, suppose you took the prime of the prime of the prime, then you would get uh, triple prime, or that's called the derivative of the derivative of the derivative of y told you it's more of the same. The only thing different today? To oh yeah baby. Um, Alright. Uh, so so the, uh, the, uh, the other thing we should do is probably look at the different notation. Some people, we used to use prime for some times and <clears throat> other people prefer to dy dx. We really should be really good at both. They're both super important. Uh, so let's do, let's see what it would look like with uh, D, D, X. If you have just plain old Y, you slap a D, D, X on this, and that would be the first derivative. But what if you took the derivative of that? Uh, well, they would, it would look like the derivative of the derivative of Y. It would look like this. And But people don't write it. Well, yes, you could write it this way, but what people do is usually they put these two together, the D, X and the D, X. They put them together to write D square over D, X square of Y. That's how people write. This is called the second derivative, or the derivative of the derivative of y. Clear? All right. I think uh, you get the idea here. This would be called the derivative of the derivative of the derivative of y, or people would usually call it third derivative uh, with respect to x um, of y. Hey, you want to get a little crazy? I just thought about something. We could get a little crazy. What if you did d dx of y? And then on top of that, you did d d u of that, and then you did d d x 
no, 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 D, D, Z of that. Ooh, take that. You got all kinds of variables up here, so you'd get a third derivative, a D, Z, D, U, D, X of Y. Chew on that. I'm just kidding. Maybe someday you'll do that. Um, anyways, that's enough on the notation. Let's actually do it. So I suppose I give you an actual problem. Y is equal to that. Can you find the first derivative, the second derivative, and the third derivative? And uh, let's do it with a D notation. So let's find the first derivative first. Slap a D, D, X on this side. Slap a D, D, X on that side. By the way, you can also do this with implicit differentiation, like we did last chapter. That's okay. But I'm not so concerned with practicing that today. Today I want to practice the higher order derivatives. So this would be dy dx and that would be equal to uh, 8x to the third. There you go, you're done. First derivative, check. Let's go with blue now for the second derivative. d dx of this side and d dx on that side. That would give us second derivative. On the left hand side that would be second derivative of y with respect to x. On the right hand side that would be 3 por 8, 24x squared. Perfect. And there you go, you've got your uh, second derivative. And if that was fun, you can go for the third derivative. Why not? Make it, uh, let's make it white. d dx of this, d dx of that. I'm slapping a d dx on both sides. That would give me the third derivative of y. And that's equal to uh, 48x. That was fun, right? Third order, first, second, and third. I told you it's more of the same. Didn't I tell you? Can't believe I get paid to do this. I'm like a DJ living inside the body of a mathematician. Yeah, baby, coming to you from Chula Vista by request. Third order. I'm just playing. All right, let's do it again. Uh, well, we just did that one. Let me see. Oh yeah, let's do this one. Let's find the first derivative. Uh, we'll start off with uh, y here, d dx on slap a d dx on both sides. All right, so this would tell me the first derivative dy dx is equal to whoa whoa whoa. E is a constant, uh, famously known to be a constant. It's two point seven eight one eight blah 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 times two. That's a constant. Derivative of a constant is zero. Bam! There it is. Your first derivative zero. I'll see it again. I'll do it again. Watch the derivative of y. That would be just dy dx. And the derivative of a constant, zero. I told you. Of course, we don't want to stop there. Let's go with uh, the second derivative. So slap a d dx on that. Slap a d dx on that. That would be the second derivative of y with respect to x. And that's equal to zero. Done. Take it to the bank. That's too easy, right? I bet you guys can't guess what the third derivative is. Third derivative, let's go with thread. Uh, so once you've got the second derivative, all you do is slap a d dx on both sides, and that would give you third derivative on the left hand side. Third derivative of y with respect to x, and that would be equal to the derivative of zero is still zero. Derivative of constant, any con any real constant is always zero. Uh, you can guess what the fourth derivative is, and the fifth and sixth and seventh, uh, all the derivatives are zero. That's so f not fun. How about this one? Alright, this one make, is a little bit interesting because it's not a constant. Let's do it. So, I'm going to go with the first derivative first. d dx on both sides. That would give me dy dx, which is a first derivative. And uh, on the right hand side, alright, the 2 can come out of there. The 2 is, you can pull the constant. All you're really worrying about is the derivative of e to the x. But that's a super famous, it's on the super famous sheet, the big and famous ideas. The derivative of e to the x with respect to x is, of course, just e to the x. So there you go. That's the first derivative. Isn't it? And look at this. It's an interesting. This first derivative is equal to the original y to begin with. It was left unchanged, which sort of gives you a clue as to what do you think would happen for the second derivative, d dx on both sides. Slap a d dx on both sides, that means the second derivative with respect to x, I'm just looking at the left hand side, the second derivative with respect to x is equal to, again you'd pull the constant and that would be equal to 2 e to the x. Whoa, what happened? Stays the same. 
what do you suppose sometimes it's fun to find patterns here and I, I put a lot of these on the homework uh, by the way if you're not doing the homework you're not really trying hard enough there's three steps learning this stuff watching the hands first step it's the most passive step you don't have to do anything just watch the second step takes it up a notch you gotta do the homework you gotta sit there and struggle through the problems and make your brain think and then uh, it, you know sometimes I'll ask for different patterns to take you just a little bit further than the lecture that's done that by design and the third step is those self quizzes those self quizzes are masterpieces you gotta look at every single choice uh, with uh, some serious thought and see if uh, we're pointing we're looking at creative ways of thinking about it after all math is about creativity if you thought math was just about find the answer I got bad news for you I'm gonna light your fire it's not okay math is about creatively thinking perfection beauty and creativity and reasoning like you won't see anywhere else anyways don't let me get started on that so slap a D, DX on both sides, that will give you the third derivative of Y with respect to X, and that's equal to, again, it stays the same. This is a nice little pattern. It's telling you that the nth derivative for any N uh, of Y would still be equal to 2E to the X. This is a fun little pattern here based on the first few derivatives. It's clear. Uh, by the way, usually this N is, an, is a natural number like 1, 2, 3, 4, one of these numbers, not a fraction or a negative. But often people will write it this way, n is a natural number. This is a fancy way of saying n is either 1, 2, 3, 4, or one of those numbers, not some other fraction or uh, complex or strange things. Anyways, uh, that was a pretty easy pattern to, to, to do. Um, why don't we try to find this one? But this time I want to, you know what, I'm th I think we got enough of that notation. Let's use the prime notation now. So the first thing we do is prime both sides. And of course, the the weakness with the primes is that you don't know with respect to what the der the derivative with respect to what. So it's understood, or we'll assume here that the prime is with respect to x. Okay. So when you just have plain x, you don't need the, the chain rule, or if you do the chain rule, you just get plain one. All right. So y prime that would be on the left hand side. The derivative of sine would be cosine x, and you're done. There's your y prime. Suppose you wanted to go for the double prime. So you prime each of those sides, and that would give you y double prime is equal to negative sine x. Right? The derivative of cosine is negative sine x. That was fun. Say you wanted to go for the triple prime, so then you go with uh, white. Prime that, prime that, and that would give you y triple prime is equal to negative cosine x. Right? The root of sine, the negative comes out of there. The negative, just pull it out of there. Worry about the sine. The root of sine is cosine, and so you just get negative cosine. But wait, there's more. What if you wanted to do another prime? Prime, prime. That would give you y four primes, and that's equal to the root of cosine. Let's leave the negative out of it, okay? The root of cosine is negative sine. Negative negative sine would give you positive sine. That would give you a total of sine x. Capish? And it's interesting that the fourth derivative turns you back to where you started. You could write it this way. 1, 2, 3, 4 is equal to original y. In fact, this I can't believe I just wrote this. This is a fourth degree differential equation. From your differential equations class, you would be given this and asked to work backwards and find out what y is, more or less. So I'll write it this way. This is This is your very, very first differential equation that you see. It's a course you'll take later. Anyways, uh, another thing I want to point out is that people get tired of writing these primes. Ta -ta 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 -ta. That gets old. Uh, and so a better notation is this 4 with parentheses here. People will write this is common notation. And that's, uh, uh, let me see if you guys can't see that. That that's, it means four little dot, four primes. And so uh, it doesn't mean parentheses. If you put the parentheses, it doesn't mean exponent, I'm sorry. It means primes. Whenever you see the uh, parentheses, see y to the fourth. That means y, y, y. y to the fourth with that, that means y, one, two, three, four primes, fourth derivative. They mean totally different things, don't confuse them. No parentheses, yes parentheses, totally different things. Okay? By the way, guess what the, guess what the eighth derivative would be? If every four brings you back to where you started, well the eighth derivative would be sine x as well. 
you know what the twelfth derivative would be? The twelfth derivative would be sine x. Because four goes into it evenly. You know what the four hundredth derivative would be? You guessed it, sine x. What would the four hundred and one derivative be? Four hundred and one. Well it'd be the derivative of the four hundredth derivative. Right? It would be the derivative of this one. Which would be cosine x. Right? That's, this should be four one. I reckon. I told you it's more of the same. It's the only thing different today. Okay, um, that's the prime notation. Let me see what else we got here. Cosine, you guys want to try the pattern for cosine? So y prime would be, slap a prime on that side, slap a prime on that side, it would be negative sine x. Done with the first prime. Want the second derivative? Whoa. All you do is take the first, all you do is take one derivative of the derivative. So I slap a prime on both sides, and that will give you y double prime is equal to negative uh, cosine x. And you want another one? Take the prime of that, take the prime of that. That gives you triple prime is equal to positive, right? Because this is a negative, derivative of cosine is negative. Positive sine x. And of course the fourth derivative would be uh, cosine x and it's get, got, got you back to where you started, a similar pattern. Um, anyways, that's getting kind of boring. So let me tell you uh, a little bit about the, oh yeah, you, this would be a nice pattern to find. Maybe I'll do this one. One more for the road, huh? But I got with some other, the next thing I want to tell you after I do this, I want to tell you the interpretations. What, what exactly does that mean in real life? Maybe shed some light to why in the world you'd even be interested in this stuff. Um, let me pause this for a second. Alright, so we're going to find the pattern on this one. First thing we're going to do is we're going to slap a prime on both sides. Prime. Prime. Right? Yeah. And then the thing, the thing about this one is that it's hard. You, know, you might want to do quotient rule here, but you may not want to because uh, you could rewrite it this way. Um y prime is equal to 2 to the, sorry, y prime is equal to x to the negative 2 prime. If you rewrite it as x to the negative 2, you can use power rule instead of quotient rule. See, this is written as a quotient 1 over x squared. This is written, this is equivalent, but it's written as a, to where you could use the power rule. And so this is a slightly more convenient way to write it. Uh, negative 2 x to the negative 3 not that I'm big on convenience, but uh, um, I'm big on ideas, but uh, this doesn't matter. So there, there's no idea here, it's just convenience. Uh, so you bring it down, you subtract one, there's a the first derivative, done. Uh, and then I'm going to go on and find the second derivative, but of course what I'm after is a pattern here just for fun. Uh, so I take a double prime here and that would give me uh, negative 2 times negative 3 times x to the negative 4. Right? Is that right, Diego? <laughs> hmm. And, uh, and then you'd be done. And you could, if you multiply this out, you get positive 6, but you will hide the pattern. So I suggest don't multiply it out. Let's see what happens with the next derivative. Uh, let's do a prime of that and a prime of that. That would give us y triple prime. Is I equal to that color. that's white color. Oh. That would give us a total of negative four times negative three times negative two x to the negative five. And so by that point, you start to see the pattern. Um, you see what would it be? You see the four, three, two. You could tell what the fourth one's going to be. It's going to be negative five times negative uh, four times negative three times negative two times x to the negative six. And so you see y to the fourth would be equal to, you count how many negatives you want, you have. The, when they go away down here, the, then? Yeah. You count how many negatives you got, you got one, two, three, four negatives. It's not a coincidence that you have four negatives and this is to the fourth. You have negative one to the fourth. That takes care of all the negative ones. And then you have five times four times three times two. At the end of a week. That's, you got another OE, that's 5 factorial, 5 times 4 times 3 times 2. On my arm. 
is 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 um, times 1 actually but the 1's not going to matter uh, and then uh, let me think you have x to the negative 6 the question is whether or not you could take this pat this uh, idea here and turn it into a pattern so for example y to the 7th what would that no the 7th derivative of y what would that be I'm, I'm guessing it would be negative 1 to the 7th times this one's got to be one more than that one. So if that one was four, this one's five. That's seven. That's eight factorial. And then x to the negative six. This is four. You add two and make it negative. So this is seven. That would be negative nine. You see the pattern? Um, again, if maybe if it was the tenth derivative, it would be negative one with ten of ten negative ones. Negative one times negative one ten times. And then I add one more. So that would be eleven factorial. And then I go x to the negative uh, 12. I subtract 2 and make it negative. So, so you can easily tell the nth pattern would be negative 1 to the nth uh, n plus 1 factorial x to the negative n plus 2. Can you see that? There you go. That's a pattern. Okay. So anyways, a lot, I put a lot of these on the homework. Uh, it might be fine just to try to find patterns. Uh, if not, uh, just find the first few of them. One, two, three, whatever. Uh, and, okay, after finding and becoming good at the derivatives and becoming good at the prime notation and double prime and also the denotation, d to the third, dx to the third, after becoming good at these notations, the next thing I think is important to talk about is what in the world is this, is this good for? So, so I got a good example here. This is the, the most classic of all examples. Um, it's probably one of the things that started the whole story in the first place. All right, let's see if we can um, make, uh, make some mean sense of these uh, first and second and third and fourth and fifth derivatives. No, let's just see if we can make sense of the first and second derivatives, okay? Uh, let's take a look at the most classic of all examples, the position function. So the position function, suppose you were to plot this and you were to ask, well, what is the uh, tangent slope here? What's the correct interpretation? Or what's one interpretation of the slope here? Well, the slope there would be change of y over change of x, as we all know. Change of y would be a little change in position over a little change of time. And you try to interpret, what does that mean when you change position over a certain amount of time? Suppose the change of time is maybe two hours, the change of position maybe is uh, five miles. So every five miles, or every two hours, every five miles. Uh, it's not too bad. It's easy to interpret. Uh, this would be equal to velocity. Now, what what that means exactly? Uh, I should probably pause and, and tell you more about it. It's an instantaneous velocity at a certain point. Um, so maybe I should just make a make a little mark here. The instantaneous velocity, because the average. If you want, just wanted the average velocity. Uh, well, you, you would just do, you know, take two secant points and you would do change, the big change in position over a big change of time. And that would be um, uh, the average velocity, velocity average. So there's this little nuances here. You have to figure out whether you're doing it at a certain single point. Uh, I call that instantaneous velocity. Or you're doing it over a secant. The secant would look more like, uh, more like this uh, from some point to another point. That would be... If I was to take the average, that would be change in time or change of uh, position. Uh, these triangles are supposed to mean or reference a larger amount, where the d's reference uh, or simply signify an incredibly small change, uh, meaning an instantaneous, meaning the slope, the stuff that we've been calculating all this time. So, but a lot of people don't write this uh, all the time. They just write uh, velocity is equal to position uh, distance divided by time, right? That's, that's what they usually tell you. But it doesn't tell you the whole story whether that's instant instantaneous or uh, average velocity. So we'll we'll try to make a distinction here. Uh, anyways, we're trying to see what is the interpretation of the second derivative. So if you take this velocity and you took the derivative, what would happen? Well, you'd have to go to the next graph here. The change of position over change of time is equal to velocity. So what would happen if you plot velocity versus time so that you'd, you would get the slope here? Change of velocity over change of time. Well, you have to sit there and think a little bit about the units. By the way, when I write this D stuff, that means instantaneous change. 
instantaneous rate of change of velocity with respect to time. Again, I could do the secant and that would be the average. But let's just forget about the question whether it's secant or instantaneous. Let's go with instantaneous. Consider the units. The change of velocity would be changing, for example, like 5 miles per hour. That's velocity. Suppose you went from 15 miles per hour and you changed to from 15 to 20 miles per hour. So the change in velocity was 5 miles per hour. And suppose you did that over 2 seconds. You know, that means you you increase the velocity by 5 miles per hour in 2 seconds. That's what kind of units are those? That's that's called acceleration. And so here's the but the acceleration is the change of the the change of velocity over change of time and in this case I'm denoting instantaneous. At that rate you were accelerating at a certain rate. At that point, uh, you know, the, the speedometer was changing at a certain rate. That's what instantaneous velocity would mean. That's what it means when you put the d's. Without the d's, it might just be an average velocity, or sometimes they put triangles here, uh, or sometimes the triangles are understood. Sometimes people will just write it this way. Uh, putting the d's on there just makes it instantaneous, which is incredibly much harder to calculate because you're really dividing something infinitely close to zero divided by something infinitely close to zero. So the, putting these on there, all it does is uh, put make it instantaneous. But there's more. What if you put these two statements together? In other words, to get to here, what you would have done is you've taken this one, uh, which is your dp over dt is equal to v, and you slap a ddt on this side and a ddt on that side, and you get that the second derivative of position with respect to time is indeed the f derivative of the uh, velocity with respect to time, which is in fact acceleration. So here it is, our, our first and most classical interpretation of a second derivative. The second derivative of position with respect to time, missing the two there, is acceleration. Let me say that one more time. Here's our first meaningful and importantly classical interpretation of second derivative. The second derivative of the position function is acceleration because uh, the first derivative is velocity. And when you take the derivative of the velocity, you're getting the rate of change of velocity with respect to time, and that's called acceleration. Therefore, a meaningful interpretation of the second derivative. You follow that? So, so that's how it goes. This is the most classical one. Uh, change of position over change of time gives you velocity. Change of velocity over change of time gives you acceleration. Okay, but but let me make that even bigger and more broader and more general. What exactly made this work this way? What exactly gave it made it the interpretation important? Let me try to isolate the essence of it. The velocity times time is equal to the position, right? And this is of course assumes a secant version of it. You know, a certain velocity over a certain amount of time. You know, you're doing average stuff here. That becomes uh, that the velocity is equal to p over t, position over time. And again, so a lot of people forget to put the triangles here. Really, it means a, change, a certain amount of position that was changed in, over a certain amount of time. But the instantaneous one will deal with the uh, derivative of position with respect to time at a certain... I put a little i here for instantaneous. In other words... Putting the d's here on top and the bottom, all it does is, is turn the velocity from average into instantaneous. That's the interpretation. But really, it comes from any time you have a quantity a is equal to uh, b over c, you, the instantaneous rate of change of a would be db over dc. This is a general um, principle. The little d's make it instantaneous, and that's why I put a little i there. But the thing that made this work was the fact that the v could be replaced with at and making it a t square, this is an a, a t square is equal to p, so that a is equal to the position over time square. Again, this is uh, over a secant. The instantaneous acceleration would be the rate of change of position over the rate of change of, of time squared. Putting the d's there on top and on the bottom makes it instantaneous. And that's exactly what the phenomena that makes it work, uh, makes the interpretation meaningful. The fact that a, this is the fact that this is what made it meaningful. The fact that a times t square was something meaningful. It was position. That right there is exactly what made it meaningful. The fact that 
the acceleration times time square was equal to something meaningful, position. All you do is make it uh, put these on top and bottom, and that turns it in from a secant slope into a tangent slope, giving you instantaneous acceleration at a certain point. All you do is evaluate it at a certain time, and you get the instantaneous acceleration. But you see the implications of looking at it this way, which I had never looked at it this way before until just a couple minutes ago, by the way. <laughs> But the implications are huge because, think about it, every single time you've got something like b times x to the third is equal to m. If m is something meaningful and b is something meaningful and x is something meaningful, then you've got something meaningful here. b is equal to m x to the third, which would be at over average. If you wanted to find the instantaneous one, guess what you would do? You would do the third derivative of m with respect to x to the third. That, my friends, that's what makes it meaningful. Every single time you've got something like this, b, some meaningful quantity times some other meaningful quantity raised to some power, this is the number of derivatives you'd have to take. If this was a 2, you'd do second derivative. If this was a 3, you'd do third derivative. If this was a 5, you'd do the fifth derivative. Every single equation that humans have ever encountered that looks like this, a times u to the n is equal to b where b is meaningful, a is meaningful, n is a natural number, like 1, 2, 3, 4, oh, then you've got a perfect scenario for higher order derivatives. Beautiful stuff, huh? Because then a would be equal to b over u, n, and the instantaneous rate of change of a, now the instantaneous a, whether that's acceleration or whatever, voltage, the instantaneous at a certain point can be given by taking the derivative, the nth derivative, uh, of B with respect to U. See why they pay me? You see why they pay me? Insane amounts of money. Look at that. Insane amounts of money. That's why they pay me. Just kidding. That was unnecessary. Alright, you guys gotta do the homework. Uh, see you guys here next time. Peace.